All right, in a recent poll on my channel, I asked you folks what you want to see more of, and many of you said more commentary and analysis of movie fight scenes. So this is basically a video response to Jill Barrab, who gave me the idea because she was commenting on fight scenes in Loki, and I just finished watching it recently. And so that seems like a good idea, and I agree with what she said. Just want to expand a little bit on some points here and there. I'll link to her video in the description down below, of course. By the way, I've been enjoying the show, otherwise I wouldn't have watched season one, but I'm gonna go pedantic mode because I think there's more entertainment value in nitpicking the oddities than there is in highlighting the positives, at least for viewers on this channel, I presume. So I liked it, even though I'm probably gonna sound a bit negative because of the focus on things that bothered me a little bit, or rather, bothered this little overthinking bastard on my shoulder. And obviously this is gonna be spoilers galore. If you haven't watched season one yet, but intend to, you might wanna hold off on this video until you've watched it because spoilers everywhere. Nobody seems to have explained to the TVA how best to use a stick where one end is pointy and the other end is instant disintegration. Why would you not use that like a fencing foil or a small sword? This bothered me too. And I would go even further to say that TVA hunters have absolutely no clue about how to use the tools they have and how to fight in general, really. So, um, props. Behold the TVA baton. Uh, yeah. Don't criticize it or I'll prune you. So uh, you have a device on one side that instantaneously, shall we say, removes a threat. And then you have a pointy bit on the other end. I couldn't quite tell if it's a spike or a sharp blade, but either way, they also use it for slashing. Interestingly, earlier in the season, it is just a baton without the spike or blade, which makes me think that the pointy version might have been an afterthought for a later fight scene, which we'll get to later. Whoa, hang on. I almost forgot to comment on the unusual guard position. Can't just skip an opportunity for overthinking. Might have cost the Nexus event. Anyway, so uh, this is the position that they take. At first I thought, huh, that's odd. Shouldn't it be like this? Wait, apparently they changed things up more quickly than I can edit. This is a thing too. All right, um, well, back to the point I was trying to make. If the idea is to guide the thrust, you know, this is a little bit more stable compared to just this. But then I thought, you know what, you can't actually justify that. If you're like in the first episode, when they're facing Loki, who was unarmed with a weapon like this, they will want to try to wrench it away from you, obviously, disarm you. If you have the hand up here, it's available to respond to that. So if somebody tries to grapple, go for the baton, your hand is right there and you can kind of intercept them. Uh, if they try to grab it from the underside, you can push against it like this. So it actually makes some sense and you can still guide the thrust. Like, I feel like this works a little bit better, it's a little bit more stable, but you can still do it like this. It's still more stable than not using the extra hand. Now, of course, it's still a stylistic choice. They wanted to make them look different and I totally respect that. Uh, realistically, why not just hold it like this? You know, because then you get the same benefits. You can do this, this sliding thrust for more control. And, you know, you have two points of contact on the weapons. So that in and of itself makes it harder to wrench it from you. You can grapple more easily that way. And um, the hand is still available to respond to whatever is going on. Whether you want to do it like this or like this or, you know, with the thumb on top. Either way, this, I think this would make the most sense to me. But... I don't really have a big problem with this. I have some problems with this <laughs> design. Uh, first off, um, no matter what you do, you're pointing a weapon at yourself. That's not really a great thing. <laughs> so either you're um, threatening to self prune if you want to stab somebody, because I mean, let's face it, if the opponent does anything, you know, let's say, they evade your thrust and they get a hold of the baton. They can do, now just, you know, poke it forward. Plus, there are many situations in a fight where something might go wrong. You don't always have 100% control 
ideally you do, but combat is unpredictable and things can go wrong. So whatever can go wrong, I mean, there's so many ways you can swipe yourself with this thing, you know, unless you're extremely careful. And even then, there are definitely situations where I, I just would not want this to threaten me as well. And again, the other end, so this is the, the most dangerous end. If you threaten somebody with this, then yeah, you also threaten yourself with the blade. Not fantastic, really. I, I'm not digging the idea. I think you would be better off without the blade. This is the business end, and that's really the important part. The way this is designed, I'm assuming that the sides are basically insulated, and the dangerous part is this right here, the top because they never seem to swing at someone and prune them that way. Every time they prune someone, they always jab them with this part here. Also, there's this one scene where a hunter gets mind controlled and attacks another and uh, grapples with the baton. And that piece is actually resting basically on the shoulder of the other TVA hunter and nothing happens. So I'm assuming that this is not dangerous, this is. So we are effectively dealing with a thrusting weapon only, unless you want to use it non-lethally, in which case you could either deactivate the pruning device or just strike with it if it's insulated anyway. So now it's a less lethal bludgeon. Not exactly non-lethal entirely, but less lethal. Conceptually, this could be a fantastic weapon because all you gotta do is briefly touch someone and they disappear. It doesn't matter how skilled they are. It doesn't matter what armor they have, anything. You touch them, they disappear. Fantastic, right? Especially considering that in the first episode, they show that there's either a second mode or a different variation, or should I say variant, of this weapon, which is capable of slowing someone down to 1 16th, which is a fantastic ability and that's the first and last time that we ever see it. That really irked me. Like you can't just introduce such a powerful feature, have a character use it once, and that's it. Never to be seen or heard of again. So I don't know if you can switch the same baton into the time slowing mode, or if it's a different model, but either way, that's hella useful. I mean, if I have the choice between the pruning version and the time slowing version, if they are indeed separate, I'm going to go for the time slowing all the time, you know, even though it's a bit unfortunate that you actually have to hit someone with it to activate it. And this is also a little bit weird. This swing was so slow and telegraphed that even a regular person with a minimum of martial arts training should be able to evade it. Yet Loki a god is just hit by it. I mean, I guess we can assume that he was just so cocky that he assumed that it wouldn't do anything to him, so he just took it, but it's... There, there are a lot of things here that feel like the boss when you fight him versus when you unlock him. Loki used to be an Avengers level threat, and now some mere mortals come along with some fancy gadgets and subdue him easily. Um, it's one of the reasons why I, even though I like this, show, I don't really consider it canon in any way. It's interesting, but it just seems like a different Loki. Also, in terms of character and behavior, he doesn't have the wit that he normally does. He doesn't have the skill he normally does, etc., etc. Anyway, back to the TVA. The guards in the Chamber of the Timekeepers are a case of when you lie on the resume and get the job anyway. When Hunter B-15 barges in, this is how they respond to the threat. Let's watch that again. Guard number one's expert dangerous fighting move. Twirlies. Guard number two's expert dangerous fighting move. I'm not kidding. That's what he does. If you think that's weird and unnecessary, look at what they're doing next. Yeah, the dude twirls his baton behind his back in an unprecedented case of tactical genius. That'll show him. And here it is again, the universal reason why movie characters are able to fight multiple opponents. They don't do fuck all. Look at this guy in the background. It's like, 
Yeah, I'm getting paid by the hours, and I'm just gonna be twirling. Because of the usual director compulsion to constantly jump cut, it's a bit hard to see exactly what's happening in the fight scenes. But if we slow it down, we can see that there's definitely some convincing looking stuff. You know, when Loki has to defend himself without a weapon, he deflects strikes with his forearms. If somebody swipes at you with a blade at the end of the stick, basically, then yeah, as long as you deflect it off to the side with your forearm, instead of trying to just take it head on and get your forearm broken, you're good generally. So there's definitely some good stuff. And apparently the blade works very selectively. Here you can see Loki being cut in the arm. There's another case of a cut to the arm through the clothing. But Sylvie apparently gets struck in the face and it's nothing, not even a scratch. You know, her face should be sliced open, right? Tom Hiddleston puts in some good effort here. No surprise, he's a great actor after all. So he's really trying to sell the moves. There he deflects a thrust coming in with his palm. I actually showed that in a recent video, how you can do that if you're attacked by a blade with bare hands. You really just need to nudge it off to the side. You don't need to stop it or anything. Uh, the, again, the response is a little odd here. Deflection. Let me twirl. Someone should have seriously taught them some rapier or small sword or even fighting with a short spear. You know, if you thrust and somebody deflects your thrust, you don't spin, you simply disengage and thrust again. It's not that hard to recover from it, you know, because there's not that much, even, even if they nudge you quite a bit, like you can still turn this around. You think the guy on the right here is the same as before? You know, the, the low effort guy? Uh, one kicks Loki in the face, the other twirls his baton. He clearly doesn't want to be there. I gotta say though, I like how they sell this thrust. That looks powerful and effective. If only that was part of TVA training. However, as usual, you can tell the difference between important characters and random mooks because there are hunters that can actually fight. This, for example, that's pretty good. So um, it's possible for them to, at least for some of them, to know how to fight. Anyway, let's move on from the poor, probably underpaid, undertrained TVA goons and onto the sword fight between Loki and Sylvie. Now, uh, here's something that Jill pointed out. We cut away, and when we come back, their positions have reversed. I'm not averse to reaction shots, they can be fun, and they do help increase your range of choices when editing, but the fact that they literally swap places in between shots is a little bit jarring. Cutting back and forth between different perspectives can be confusing, but I think in this case, they do actually show that the two are circling each other. Because you can see here that Sylvie is passing the camera. Like, you can see them from the side first, and then the camera basically points at a right angle, and Sylvie crosses that. So apparently they're circling and they are actually changing position here. So I think that's plausible. I do like this part of the fight for the general fanciness, even though I'm not really sold on the distance. Like, I'm not sure you needed to do that. I'm not sure she was actually close enough to hit you. Not being sold on the distance is an understatement. Those are some shenanigans right there. I mean, it's a cool move that Sylvie does. It's, it's almost like a two-leg version of a capoeira kick. But yeah, the, the distance is completely wrong and Loki does not need to be flying through the air like that to evade that. There are much simpler ways. Overall, I think the fight choreography here is done well visually. It works, it looks good. It's nice how they combine sword fighting and magic abilities. Uh, there is a bit of an awkward dimension to it in that they're not actually trying to kill each other, but the way they're cutting, um, if one of the two messes up a parry, they're gonna be very seriously injured if not killed. So it's difficult to fight each other with sharp swords if, you're, if you don't wanna kill each other. Here's where it gets really weird. So Sylvie's trying to cut down the TBA's puppet master. What does Loki do to prevent that? He teleports right in the way of his wing. Yikes. First off, like Jill points out, there's no way she could actually cut him here. 
There's a desk in between, she's too far away, her blade is not long enough, there's no way, what was she even doing here? And when Loki teleports in a way, he's not close enough, she should cut him here if she hadn't completely messed up her swing. Uh, I don't have a sword that's terribly similar to hers right now. Uh, the Executioner from Zombie Go Boom would have been perfect, but I don't have that anymore. So um, if you actually look at the way she's swinging here, she's not doing it like this. Her edge alignment is completely off. She's basically striking with the flat, which explains why, why Loki survives it. She's basically just smacking him with the flat of the blade that's fine, but why was what was she trying to do anyway? Was she just trying to knock the guy out? I would have assumed that she was trying to actually cut. That would look a little bit different than what she did. I also find it funny how she almost accidentally slices his jugular open. If you look at this here, her edge ends up on his neck and then she puts it down on his chest. <laughs> that could have gone very wrong. So in short, if the characters involved were more efficient with their weapons, this would have gone down a lot differently. So definitely some oddities here and there, but again, still worth watching, absolutely. Uh, I just wish they had brought back the 1 16th speed thing. Wouldn't that have come in handy against multiple opponents? That would have been great if they had gotten a hold of that. You know, like you, you slow down, a few of them, now you only have to deal with one or two at a time. But then again, it doesn't matter because they love their twirlies and don't actually attack you, so you can safely ignore them. Anyway, hope you found this entertaining. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.